welcome to the Healthy Peaceful Podcast, where I interview individuals on topics pertaining to the meaning of health and well-being, personal collective consciousness, and maximizing full human potential. In this series, I take a deep dive into habit change, specifically a holistic approach to habit change. I promise you that this won't be same old, same old, but an exploration in the intricate dynamics of habit formation and change essentially offering you a framework for personal and professional progress. Join me as I invite guests who have studied how to create change that sticks. Now, finally an opportunity to unlock the key to realizing your full potential. While we've all heard of the mind-body connection, we often don't have the real knowledge to harness this connection, to cultivate healthier habits, foster better relationships, and enhance overall well-being. Now, whether you're new to these concepts or a seasoned student of human potential and habit change, join me on this journey as I explore a holistic approach to habit change and coaching. Tune in to the Healthy Peaceful Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Robert Keith Wallace, PhD, a distinguished scientist, researcher, and author who has made significant contributions to the fields of neuroscience, physiology, and holistic health. With a PhD in physiology from UCLA, Dr. Wallace has dedicated his career to exploring the intricate relationship between mind, body, and consciousness. Dr. Wallace's journey into the realm of holistic health began early in his career sparked by his fascination with ancient wisdom traditions such as Ayurveda and meditation. Over the years, he has become a leading authority on the integration of these ancient principles with modern scientific understanding. Currently serving as chair of the Department of Physiology and Health at Maharishi International University, Dr. Wallace continues to lead groundbreaking research and academic programs aimed at bringing holistic approaches to mainstream recognition. He is also a respected member of the university's board of trustees, having previously served as its first president. In today's episode, we'll delve into his book, co-authored with Carol Paradis, Neurohacking for Online Learning, Study and Life Habits Optimized for Your Personal Mind, Body, Energy State. In this book, Dr. Wallace explores innovative strategies for optimizing study and life habits at a time when digital has become the norm. Drawing upon his extensive research and practical experience, he presents a comprehensive framework for leveraging mind-body energy states to enhance learning outcomes and overall well-being in an online environment. Whether you're a student navigating the challenges of online learning or simply curious about harnessing the power of your mind-body connection for greater productivity and well-being, today's interview promises to be enlightening and transformative. Join me as I uncover the secrets of neurohacking with the esteemed Dr. Robert Keith Wallace and discover how you can unlock your full potential for success in the online learning landscape. Welcome, Dr. Wallace. Hi, Noreen. All right. Well, we're going to, we're just going to plunge right in. Um, (laughs) First, I want to start off with, not that you need inspiration, because it seems like everything inspires you, which I love. Okay. But specifically, what inspired you to write Neurohacking for Online Learning? And what motivated you to focus on optimizing study and life habits for personal mind, body, energy states? Well, um, it was actually an invitation by uh, the president and dean to our provost to do it because they were concerned with retention at the university. And um, so they thought, well, could we have a class that would help students? And we know from a lot of experience that online learning is so much more challenging um, you know, you've got kids running around, you got a job, you got all these things happening while you're trying to learn. You don't 
come to university and have that quiet, pristine environment. You have to deal with everything while life is at its full force. So we, uh, Carol, who is really spectacular in this area, she's the associate director of our department, and she really um, helped create this. So we work together and try to figure out how could we help students when they first enter the online environment. And uh, I had been working before that on habit change. So I applied some of the principles that we had in habit change to online learning. And the result was this book and this course that we offer now as the first two weeks of all the students online into the university. So we had a lot of experience with students with it. And it really does work. It's huge what you know, just taking a little time to help them form new study habits, which are different than any study, any study habit they've ever had before, giving them the kind of the guidelines of what it takes to change a habit, getting them to have a buddy, getting them to work in a group, just, um, you know, methodically going through some very simple steps does make a huge difference. And it's been a joy to do it. And it's been incredibly informative. I had no idea what how difficult the lives can be of an online student. That's great. So the book actually came about from a course that you developed at the university to assist students. And this isn't just undergraduate students or at the time, or possibly starting with, the, with all students who right. are involved in the online learning, which is becoming more and more prevalent. Right. Uh, and so you've already, you already tested this uh, and now you have a book to bring the knowledge out there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, we gave the course first and uh, based on, you know, the success and, you know, there's always need for feedback. There's need for change. You get feedback and you need um, to adjust things. Then we created the book on that basis of that experience. So yeah, tested and proven to be very good. So we keep teaching it and uh, we keep getting good results. And the book is okay. just a kind of a summary of everything we do. Right, and you've also brought the work that you've done on habit change specifically into the online learning environment. Yeah, I mean, it turns out almost everything you do in life is a habit. <laughs> and, and you know, if you don't have good habits, it's hard. And in that environment of the home where you don't have that atmosphere of everybody studying together, you do have to carve out a space. You have to go through very specific steps. And you've got to be... Um, You've got to include each of these steps. I mean, motivation is first, and that's a big thing. You have to understand what it means to set goals. You know, you can have big goals. Oh, I want to graduate. That's great. But then you got to go specific and you have to, you know, I'm going to do my homework every Monday at this time. So um, that's a very important first part. You know, obviously people are motivated because they sign up for the university. But once they get in that environment and the demands, it's a question of maintaining that motivation. And really that requires having good habits. In the end, it's all about having good habits because you don't wanna to have to think about it every day. You wanna be able to have a plan and something that happens in a very natural and easy way. And you've got uh, you know different things to help remind you, reward you. You're working with other people. So, and we we put a big emphasis because there's a lot of habit change out there and we put a big emphasis on utilizing Ayurveda, which as you know is- Well, is, I actually I actually want to get into that. But as a follow-up question, what I want to ask you about is, can you pro provide an overview of the concept of neurohacking as it pertains to online learning and how it differs traditional approaches to learning. Yeah. yeah, neurohacking is a fun word, which basically relates to almost everything we do in life. Every experience we have changes the brain. Um, we read a book, watch a movie, interact with a person, all those things 
change our brain. Our brain is insanely dynamic. Maybe it's a little molecular change. Maybe it's a whole circuit change. And we know that habits involve neural circuits. We know that, you know, when as a kid, when you learn to ride a bike, a certain circuit forms in a certain part of the brain and you don't have to think about it anymore. So neurohacking in general is just experiencing and the word hacking has, you know, come to mean something in computer software, both hardware and software. In the brain, it's both hardware, you're changing the wiring and you're probably changing the programming too. So there's a good analogy there. And um, I think people, it's more fun for people if you tell people we're gonna teach you habits. Oh, darn, that doesn't sound like fun. Whereas if you, you know, say neurohacking, wow, that's cool, I'm gonna do that. So, but ultimately you're using the nervous system to help make your life more successful. Mm. Awesome, great. And we all want that, there's no doubt. Um, I know in the book you talk about mind, body, energy states. Can you tell us why we need to know about them? Why they're crucial for effective learning and productivity in an online environment? Yeah, we incorporate knowledge from, you know, both Western science and from the ancient Ayurveda. Uh, we use uh, some tests in the book to talk about um, determining whether you're a visual, auditory, or kinesthetic learner. And that's important for a lot of people, and it, especially for online learning, because you, know, you need to be able to adapt in an environment that's easiest for you. Uh, if you're a visual learner, the auditory can be boring. So you might have to transcribe, you need something visual. If you're kinesthetic, you really need to have a lot of to-do projects. So we, we give a test, we analyze that, and that's more from the Western point of view. Um, and then we add to that Ayurveda, which has this understanding that we're all different. Um, there it's called the dosha of the individual, but we use the word uh, energy state just to kind of make it a little more Western and easier for people to understand. And there are three basic types, and they have to do with the way people operate. We're all a combination, but understanding which is the more predominant dosha or energy state helps you. So one type can be very creative, very dynamic, very excited, but they have a hard time learning habits because they like to move from one thing to another. They enjoy talking, they enjoy changing subjects, hard to get them to do a routine. And they need the routine more than anyone. They need to be grounded. So that type, the Vata type, you, you're kind of approaching it not just from a psychological standpoint, but you're approaching it from a physiological standpoint. There's certain things that that person can do that will help keep their energy state more grounded, like sipping hot water, um, having more oil, um, various yoga postures. So that is a kind of um, way of ensuring that that type of person will have a better chance of adopting a new habit, like studying, especially online learning. Pitta types are the third, I mean, second type, and they're your to-do people, very high achievers. They love to-do lists. They really don't need a lot of motivation. It all comes internal. And it's the key there is how your personal goals align with whatever you're doing. So that's a kind of an understanding. Now, physiologically too, there are certain things you can do for a pitta person that will help them stay in balance. And that's crucial for success for them. And kapha is the same thing. Uh, they have, you know, different style. They are the ones that are the hardest to get started on a new project. They like things fixed. They don't like to change things. And for them, it's really important to have a buddy, to have some help to get them going. And again, you can do certain physical things that will help them so that they're in better balance. When they're in better balance, the chances of them starting something are much better 
And once they get started, they're very steady and they're very good at sticking to it. Great. So it's it's really having some insight in terms of your personal energy, mind, body, energy state. Yeah, and it applies to everything in life, but studying, you know, in a very active environment is a big challenge. So how do you do that? And ultimately, that is what we're after is to create that kind of a situation. And so all of a sudden, you know, you got to start learning some good habits to be able to uh, get through the first class and then, you know, use those habits to get through your whole degree program because it's not like anything you've done before. And so um, we apply this habit change program to all areas of their life. Um, yeah. so studying is the number one. That's what the sure. big focus of this course is and teaching them how to make a habit map, a habit plan, how to, how to create um, habits that will help them in their, you know, getting their homework done, um, getting their, their, their whole process of, of achieving their a good grade and finishing their degree. Awesome. Um, could you share some key neuro hacks that you've outlined in your book that individuals can use to optimize their study habits to enhance learning outcomes? Sure. Uh, you know, what we do in the class is we let everybody pick what they want, which is really interesting because you, we create this kind of habit map. So right in the center of the map, you put your intention. So, okay, maybe your intention is to, you know, finish college degree. Oh, that's a little too general. Nice to have that big intention, but let's be more specific. So what's your intention? Let's get it really specific. Okay, I want to make sure I have my weekly homework done on time. Okay, good. That's a very specific kind of thing. So what might help you do that? And so you, ha you have to then think of things that will help you. For some people, it might be creating a better environment for studying, um, maybe having a designated space for them. For other people, it might be identifying a particular time in the week where they really block it out and they don't let other things encroach on it. Another person, it might be to meditate. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's a huge factor. If somebody's more calm, if they're more regular, you know, the people at this university all practice transcendental meditation. So what we found is if those people are more regular in their meditation, that really helps them because they can deal with stress better. And then they can manage what is kind of a stressful thing, which is studying in an active environment better. So you, the person would pick one of these, we call them neuro hacks, because each one is gonna change the wiring in your brain. And you pick it, and then we give you a, you know, a plan of how to do it. Um, so you identify which one to go first. Okay, maybe I'll pick you know, creating an environment for studying first. Um, and then you have some kind of prompt to get you to what to do in that case. So I'm gonna uh, you know, have a, every, um, week, I'm going to have a prompt going off, you know, do you have your or every day, do you have your environment set up for you to study, whatever that might mean, you know, is it like a space is everything laid out, do you have a to do list, whatever works for you to creating that environment. And so okay, you've do you, maybe you have a, you know, a prompt, which is, um, going off on your phone saying, okay, you know, have you got your environment created? Good. Yep. And my environment's all created. So next thing is you got to go sit down in that environment and start your studying. That's part of the, the, the habit that you're trying to do. And then, you know, you have a buddy, which is really important for some people. So every day or once a week, you check in with your buddy and the buddy asks you, you know, did you do your best to, you know, create that study environment? Um, yes, I did. I, you know, I created the space. I spent an hour today doing it or half an hour. Great. And they talk about any obstacles. Oh, yeah. You know, my kids made a mess of it and I couldn't find any of my work. It was a total disaster. Okay. Well, let's see how we can fix that. 
And then we, so we'll have different kinds of feedback. One is sort of self-reflection, you know, them keeping track of whether they're doing the habit or not. So if they're blocking out a particular time in the week, is, is Monday morning sacred or are you shifting your schedule? Um, and then, you know, so they, they have a certain objective and then they keep sort of checking in with their friend to make sure that they've achieved that objective and then hopefully they create a group and the group is even better we call them learning circles and they're just huge in terms of helping people learn because you know the buddy is great terrific but the group brings up all kinds of other experiences and people come up with new creative ideas by talking in their group and finally, then we ask them to do some kind of reward. There might be the intrinsic reward that you're getting an A. Well, that's huge. But maybe you, you know, go out with your buddy and celebrate that you got that good grade or you got your homework done. So we, we have different tool, tools that the people use to make the habit easier and more consistent. Yeah, that's great because first of all, you're allowing the student to pick the habit. Um, you're not dictating the habit. No, so, it's and really, kind of, and it's also important. Not only am I, we're not dictating, but we don't want them to do it on the basis I should do this. We want them to do it on the basis I want to do this, because the should sure. or somebody else telling you is disempowering. And yeah, what you really you, want to do is encourage them to empower themselves and you're just helping them on that journey. Right. And then they're running a series of experiments. What's working, what's not working. Right. They're garnering the support of the group. Um, what I really loved is perhaps one of the habits they want to change is get regular with their meditation practice, specifically transcendental meditation, uh, because number one, that settles the nervous system. And number two, I think something um, that is helpful is you, it goes back to what you said earlier about motivation. You know, why are they getting this degree? Um, with the transcendental meditation, I think their motivation becomes more and more clear. So I think they're more likely to keep the big picture in mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's funny because we don't choose the habit. We let them choose the habit and that they want to undertake. And it's interesting, you know, by the end of the first two weeks, a huge percentage of people are picking to be more regular in transcendental meditation, just because they recognize that to do anything, they have to be grounded. They have to, they have, to have the energy, they have, to, you know, they need that calm for 15 to 20 minutes as a basis for their activity of study. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In your opinion, what role does technology play in shaping the future of online learning? And mm -hmm. how can neurohacking principles be applied in this context? I think, you know, I'm, Crystal Ball. I'm a big favor of technology. I love AI. I think it's a challenge for teachers. Teachers, you know, often find that students use AI. And is that good? No because students need to actually think through something and learn and AI does that for them. So in that case, it's not so good. So teachers have to be more creative. They have to figure out assignments and activities where a student could use AI and still learn. Because artificial intelligence is, it has this good and bad side to it. And you know, when you give it a question, you know, say you were trying to check an Ayurveda herb and you want to check the qualities. It's not always right. It's often wrong. So you right. need to, you need to have, you know, you need to know how limited it is. On the other hand, it can really help you. You know, if you're a graduate student, and you don't understand something about statistics for your PhD, it can all of a sudden illuminate things that you didn't even think about. So it's a delicate road that I don't think anybody's figured out yet. Uh, you don't want, you know, if people use AI, it really is plagiarism. So you have to be careful that they don't do that. On the other hand, if you, you know, it's, if you could give them an assignment where you allow them to use AI and it wasn't so obvious, that would be 
probably good for them because AI is a useful tool. So a lot to work out there. We haven't figured everything out. It's a definitely a work in progress, but I think it's going to be a huge improvement for everyone. Absolutely. Great. I know you've talked a little bit about this, about um, addressing the most common challenges faced by online learners, including distractions, lack of motivation. How do you do this in your neurohacking approach? Well, again, the group is huge. I mean, we have these, you know, four levels of feedback or coaching. One is the self-reflection, self-coaching. Uh, that could be a journal. Um, it could be keeping track of your habit in a calendar. Then the buddy system is very important. Having a buddy just makes all the difference in the world. Um, then a group learning circle, very valuable. And finally, what we call environmental coaching, taking the time to um, improve your environment. If you want to go on a diet, get rid of the snacks. If you want to study better, create a space. So we we use all of these tools um, to help people and they're all important. But I would say the ones that I find the most successful are the buddy and group. Those are just huge. Yeah, absolutely. What specific strategies do you recommend for maintaining mental clarity and focus during long periods of online study? <laughs> well, I think, you know, we have what we call sort of micro habits that we try to teach people. And these are, you know, it's odd to have a habit to learn a habit. It's a kind of an odd concept, but it's not far off. Each of these types, the Vada, Pitta and Kapha, they can very easily go out of balance. And once they go out of balance, it's hard to focus. So the Vada person, if they go out of balance, they're just very, very difficult for them to study because they're, you know, moving from one thing to another way too quickly. So they need to do, you know, these micro habits can help them. It can be transcendental meditation. That's good for all the types. It could be something specific for their sleep. And for a Vada person, it could be different than a Pitta person because if you get a good night's sleep, that's also a huge difference in terms of how you do your homework. Um, and, you know, some people, uh, you know, uh, have habits of reading at night and then they stay up all night reading and they're exhausted the next day and they can't do anything. So, you know, these micro habits influence our physiology, diet, exercise, sleep and stress management or meditation. They're all for our huge hugely important for a mind that can focus and study. If your stomach is upset, if you got indigestion, it's really hard to study. If you're, um, if you don't exercise, um, not good for the physiology. And for some people, they get very lethargic. So that's also not good. So we do emphasize certain kind of best practices, which we call micro habits as a foundation for getting your mind body state in a in with a lot of energy a lot of creativity and then some of these problems just vanish i mean it's interesting people practicing transcendental meditation um, a lot of things just vanish as they are they improve in their study habits this has been tested in all kinds of different universities um, so simple things that are done to improve your mind, body state, your physiology can make a big difference in study habits. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I know you've referred to in the past uh, transcendental meditation or TM as a super habit. Yeah, I think I, you know, I think it's the biggest one that can make the biggest change because stress is such a factor in everybody's life and online learning. It's so much more than anyone can imagine the challenges people have to they have to have a kind of a discipline to compartmentalize their family maybe they're cooking food maybe they're doing this and so they you know ultimately they've got to kind of do one thing and stop another and so it's 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 very difficult 
So, um, you know, we're big on getting people to learn transcendental meditation. It just makes a big difference in their lives, you know. Awesome. Yeah. And are there some practical techniques that readers can implement from your book to optimize their online learning experience and maximize the retention of information? Say that one again. Are there some practical techniques that readers can implement from your book to optimize their online learning experience and maximize retaining the information? Yeah. I mean, do you want, I mean, if I was going to pick something, I might pick transcendental meditation, but frankly, I would say that um, that's for everyone. But again, most of the habits people pick, that's probably the most common one these students pick. I mean, they're going to a university where everybody's um, practicing it, so it's an obvious one. Other than that, what I find more interesting is that everybody picks something different because everybody's life is different. And so for me to come up with a general, you know, uh, solution for everyone, it's just wrong because everybody has different challenges. Everybody's got a different mind body type. Everybody's got a different environment. And it it's so much better when they, they know much better than I would know what's working best. And so if, you know, if I started to make a list of these things, it gets so wide and varied. I'm kind of bewildered by all the different things that people figure out to do to make their study habits better. So it's, I like the fact that it's personalized. I don't like to try to categorize it other than encouraging everyone to practice, you know, transcendental meditation. I don't have a single one that I would push, you know. So it's like Ayurveda, it's which is personalized medicine and personalized health and well-being. Um, there's general principles to success in an online er learning environment, but it's very much personalized. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything that you've learned or the university's learned from um, running these courses in terms of some innovative strategies that students have had? that you never even thought of? Yeah, all the time. I mean, I, you know, uh, because the challenges are different, you know? Sure. People that, you know, have got two jobs and they have to, you know, meditate on the on the bus going to one of their jobs. Okay. And I mean, you know, it's like, you're kind of, your jaw drops when you hear- you're, It's they're... sort of mind boggling that they can actually do it. It's totally mind boggling mm -hmm. and that they yeah. have that motivation, that determination. And you, you suddenly you think, wow, I had such a limited perspective of what's going on in these people's lives. It's so much harder, so much more challenging than I could imagine. You know, all of us who went to college, you know, and long ago, I mean, it was such a pristine, easy environment. Boy, these are not easy environments. And I'm just awed by how people fit it all in, you know? Absolutely. I, I think the other thing that's interesting about this course and running a course like this is that it gives you insight as to the challenges that students are presented with. Yeah, I um, didn't realize that who are students. You might not are. otherwise be aware of, and you can refine the online learning experience to meet those challenges. Yeah, I think it applies to everything because, you know, once I interacted with enough students and had you know seen all their different experiences and they talk really openly i mean we in these groups we create a very safe psychological environment we encourage everybody to speak so you hear things that you wouldn't normally hear they share and that's gives you a deep insight on on really not just you know study habits but content you know life i mean everything i mean i've i eyes sure, sure. are opening up you know yeah absolutely um i know it's challenging for students to balance screen time and offline activities to support their overall well-being any suggestions for how students most su successfully navigate that again so personal how dip how different people do it lee i mean i think it's 
the best thing that I've seen is groups. You know, if you can share, if you can form a group, first of all, have a buddy, that's huge. And then a group because you, you learn how to do things that you might not have thought about before. Somebody who's, you know, juggling with kids, with a job, with traveling, they come up with schemes that you wouldn't even think about. And so it's that kind of group sharing and that openness, you know, being vulnerable, willing to accept the fact that you might fail this week, but you're going to learn from that failure for next week. That's really important. So it's it's that atmosphere of open sharing that I think helps online to know that they're not in it by themselves. There are other people going through similar experiences and that they come up with innovative strategies that you wouldn't even imagine, you know. Absolutely. I, I think um, that's awesome. That's great. How about advice that you would give now that you've been involved with this for how many years has, you know, this uh, when did the book come oh, out? This, a couple this years is ago? a couple years, this program. A couple years. years now, yeah. Okay. Um, but I know you've been involved with habit change for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. What advice would you give to educators and institutions who want to, who would like to integrate neurohacking principles into their online learning platforms and curriculums? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, um, there's many applications because the students is the most obvious. So I think most of the information's in the book. They can, you know, um, glean it from there. They could talk to me. They could invite us to give a course. All those are possibilities. But the interesting thing you learn is that right now, coaching is a huge phenomena in the business world. So it doesn't make any difference whether you're an educational institution or whether you're a business or whether you're a public organization. Turns out all the leaders in these organizations need coaching. And, you know, we didn't realize that before. Our leaders had a kind of a space where they could get away and do anything they wanted. But more and more people are recognizing that it's really valuable to have someone you can talk to and reflect. Most of the time, you know your the solutions of how to make your university or how to make your company better, but you don't always do them. <laughs> it's a funny thing. So um, habit change is applies everywhere. Okay, we're talking about students here, but you have an organization that has professors, that has employees. They need habit change too. They have departments, they have teams, but all these groups depend upon people working together. And if they're not, if they don't have good habits and they don't get along with each other, then you have a kind of incoherent situation. So there's so many interesting different applications. Uh, the one in the book is, you know, that's are very clearly uh, educators could adapt or contact us. So that's simple. But then, frankly, if you want to, you know, adapt things, you kind of have to also look at the corporate culture you're in or the university culture you're in. And is that going to allow you to make changes or not? Yeah, so you're really looking at everything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so a little aside here, coaching. I know that's um, really top top of mind for you, coaching. Yeah. In every aspect of life. Right. Okay. How do you make people more receptive to feedback? They may say, oh, I, I'd like to have a coach. It sounds like a great idea. How do you how do you create the fertile ground um, that you know? I'll thank yeah. you for the feedback, and I I will actually pause and reflect versus become defensive and react. And, and you, you know, so there's kind of that um, that place where first you have to create the fertile ground for the feedback to be received properly. Yeah, you've said it perfectly. I mean, you almost can't do anything. I mean, you could give an inspiring, inspiring lecture and get people interested in the notion of 
being coached. But if somebody is adamant that, oh, I know how to do this, I don't, you know, want to. And if they think that coaching is giving advice, that's another thing. It's not consulting. So a lot of people get mixed up. They think, oh, why am I going to hire a consultant? I know better than the consultant. But coaching has nothing to do with giving advice. Giving advice is actually bad coaching because really what coaching involves is getting the person to identify the solutions themselves, asking the right questions so the person recognizes, oh, yeah, you're right. I've thought about that a lot. And, you know, I have I have a pretty good solution to it. I just don't know why I haven't done it so far. So you get the person to who knows a lot more than you do about the situation to identify, you know, what they want to do. And then the next thing is to, you know, you, you, incentivizing is good, but frankly, if they have some intrinsic motivation, that's the best, you know, they won't just want to improve it. That's really, really good. So then it's just a question of uh, helping them reach their objectives, making a plan, keeping them on track, giving them feedback, and you're not giving them advice, you're just helping them be consistent about changing what they know already needs to be changed. But they need that kind of feedback from someone else saying, you know, you did really good last week, this week you got off, no big deal. Uh, you know, just get back up on the horse again and ride. You know, it's basically, it happens, people fall off and then they need to get back up again. So ultimately coaching is, really a very supportive, easygoing, and you can't tell people what to do. All you can do is help them discover how they can help themselves, really. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 providing the opening and the accountability, I assume. Yeah, and you know, people don't often, some people don't wanna seek help and that makes it hard. So receptivity is super crucial. So I've heard of coaches firing their employees, you know, or their, so, you know, what a coach fires, you know, a president of a company, but that is real, you know, top coaches won't coach someone that is not, is so resistant. There's no point. What's the point? You're paying me a lot of money. You're saying you're hiring me as a coach, but you're actually not really using me because you don't really want to change so you can't really coach unless the person is receptive to begin with there's no hope there you know yeah yeah exactly well i know you talked about before micro habits which are essentially best practices um and we can translate that to some extent into ayurvedic principles some of the ayurvedic principles for you know the top top leadership as well yeah, I mean, it might be sort of stupid telling a, you know, top executive, hey, you know, it's really important you eat your lunch on time. I mean, the guy's going to look at you like, where did you come from? Are you crazy? But as it turns out, that's a huge factor. Most of these top executives are pitted people. They've got a lot of fire. And if they don't eat on time, they get irritable and angry. Oh, uh, yeah, well, we often see that in big companies where the top people are screaming at other people. And it could be prevented through a simple micro habit of just eating on time. So that, that's where it gets kind of odd that you're actually going to use things that seemingly have nothing to do with the goal you're trying to accomplish. But in fact, they are hugely important for certain individuals and, you know, since corporations are filled with these pit of fiery types, uh, you know, making sure that they eat and don't get ir irritable, probably, I think would probably help a lot of companies. I mean, people are drinking coffee, they're doing everything to rev up their nervous system. And they're it's not a good atmosphere to make decisions in, you need to have a calmer, more steady system. Yeah, these things that rev up their nervous system, but actually, um, uh, you know, they don't enhance their their effectiveness as leaders. Essentially, yeah, they actually they actually det they actually detract from it. They do. 
and if you make a mistake, then that's even worse because then you got to go back and correct the mistake. If you could have prevented and prevention, like is super important for health, but it's also important for studying. It's important for corporations. It's important for everyone. If you can have some very simple preventative steps. So let's say you make, you know, Monday your sacred day for doing finishing your homework because the teacher wants it due by Wednesday or something. So, and you want to have that day. So now if you do take preventative steps to make sure that nothing interferes, that that is really sacred, your chances of success go up enormously. If you aren't preventative, oh, well, I'll fit it in when I get a chance, and then you don't get a chance and you don't fit it in, um, that's, that's a problem. So having the right preventative steps, which always amount to habits, <laughs> strangely enough, they can make an enormous difference in, uh, in being more effective in studying, leadership, in so many areas of life, relationships. Absolutely. Now, always in the areas of education and business, uh, there are ethical considerations. Are there any potential ethical considerations? I know you talked a little bit about AI surrounding the use of neuro hacking techniques in the world of education no. that you can think of or no, you think I mean, are neuro hacking is a fancy word, but it comes down to something, you know, when you look at somebody who did well at college, they have good study habits and they probably learned them when they were young. Their parents probably taught them when they were in elementary school and high school and they just bring them on to college and they just they know you know how to do it and they know okay i can have fun this day but i cannot i've got to go back to focusing on my studies this other day so that you know generally uh, you know people who have gone to college have had good study habits or otherwise they haven't graduated. The online learning environment is different because people probably didn't have good habits to begin with. They, you know, they, they, they're trying. This is a second chance for them. Uh, they don't have the money or the time to go to a big college. They've got other obligations. So it's much more precious for them uh, to, and now they have to rewire their brain. They really do need some neuro hacks to get them going because they can't rely on things that they had from childhood because they didn't really get those practices down. Yeah, absolutely. Well, also, I think um, for some students, the online experience is definitely a second chance. But for others, I view it as an opportunity. Uh, for instance, the Masters of Ayurveda program at MIU um, a lot of students don't have the, wouldn't be able to study Ayurveda otherwise because they don't have the capacity to just step out of their lives for a year or two years or three years. Exactly. So it it actually, um, it really provides this wonderful opportunity that wouldn't be there otherwise. I agree. And, and you know, yeah. it does require learning some technology. So you, you do, there are, sure you know, a good university, a good program will make videos and really have, you know, uh, some coaches. We, we, you know, if students have a difficult time, we give them support from teaching assistants, coaches, um, because there is like a little bit of a technology leap you have to get over to, you know, a lot of young kids today, it comes so easy to them because they've been you know, doing things on their computer and their phone for a long time. But for some older people, it's a little bit challenging. So um, that's, you know, that's I, every university deals with that. And that really requires really good support systems for people. Absolutely. I, I know we hear this term lifelong learners. <laughs> um, how do you envision neurohacking being useful in just lifelong learning beyond formal education? Well, it's interesting, you know, because um, when I'm teaching this class, especially to undergraduate students who are going to go into Ayurveda, I, 
I tell them, look, you're just not, you're not just learning a process to help you in your studies. You're learning a process to help you with all your clients, because ultimately Ayurveda is about changing habits. You know, it's about having really good, healthy um, habits. We know, for example, that lack of exercise is the number one a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So when they someday go on and become a health coach, they need to be able to help people exercise. And that involves helping them learn new habits. So in some ways, what they're, you know, they're learning to study better, but what they're also learning is our tools that will apply to every area of their life and if they become coaches will be a tools they'll use to help other people. So the real super habit on top of, you know, of transcendental meditation, we say is a super habit, but the other super big super habit is learning how to adopt any new habit. Yeah. And if they can, you know, if they're, if they experience success in, in not only changing you know, the habits that pertain to the online learning experience, but these micro habits, their lifestyle habits to support the online learning experience, um, they have the ability to bring that out there. Yeah. No, and to see that it really every, works. It'll help, it'll help them in every part of their life. I mean, that that's the interesting thing. You don't, habits sound kind of boring and uninteresting, but when you look at habits from the bigger perspective, they, you know, in Ayurveda, they just call it daily routine, very simple, you know, but those components of daily routine are all things that are hugely important for staying in balance, for having more energy, more intelligence, better health. And they make the difference between a successful and not a successful life. Absolutely, absolutely. What impact do you hope that, that your book and the work that you're doing regarding neurohacking will have on readers' approach to online education and specifically self-improvement? Maybe you've already addressed this to some extent. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, what impact are you really hoping it's going to have on their lives? Yeah, I, I want people to uh, improve, to be successful in their lives, the best version of themselves. And I think what we outline in this book is the way to do that. Um, so I think these are, you know, the, the, the importance of this book and the importance of these classes are nothing more than to help people be the best version of themselves. Um, and, you know, whether that's learning transcendental meditation and being regular, whether that's exercising, whether that's eating better, whether that's studying better, they're all things that will help people in their lives. And I, you know, I, I, that's what I'm, I feel is important is to help other people. Absolutely. How about future direction? Developments, the, the, the developments that you foresee at the intersection of neurohacking and online learning. Yeah, I mean, I think you're touching them on something very important. Uh, Carol and I have talked about it, and we probably should be de doing more to promote it at other universities and get something going. But we're just so busy with <laughs> what's going on here that we don't have the bandwidth to take it to that other level. But I think you're right. It is something important. It could go, it could be a very uh, innovative thing, and it would require somebody to devote full time to um, you know, seeing that it's implemented everywhere. And hopefully someday we'll get to do that. But right now we're just trying to keep up with all the things going on here. Sure. Yeah, I love that because, you know, you have the prototype, it's working. Right. Uh, and as more and more higher educational institutions move to online learning, um, you know, there's there's a real need for this. There is. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'd like to move to our lightning round where I give you five words or five phrases 
And I would just like you to, um, Dr. Wallace, just tell me what immediately comes top of mind. Okay. They come from the book or the principles enumerated in the book. Cognitive enhancement. Yeah, rewiring the brain so that you can learn and and live life better. Creativity enhancement. Again, um, you know, I think of transcendental meditation for all these things because I see it as a way of rewiring the brain so it's better at anything. Creativity, intellectual. I just, you know, think found you got to lay the foundation first. You got to have a brain that's active and dynamic and a body that's healthy. Mental agility. Uh, you know, agility is a wonderful word. It has to do with how we adapt to challenges. And I think in this day and age, with all the stress, with all the changes we're all going through, um, it's really important. And that is, again, you got to rewire the brain to have greater agility. Awesome. Performance optimization. It's all the same thing. You know, to me, it's every word you're talking about is something that, for example, transcendental meditation improves and it improves it by rewriting the brain so you can get more out of because agility is a foundation of performance. Uh, all these things are kind of interrelated. They're not separate. You know, they all come from a more coherent, more optimized brain functioning. Learning efficiency. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing. They all they all they all are one thing common is that brain operating well, are your emotions settled? Do you have a good mind body state? Are you are you aware of who you are as a person and how you learn? And can you discover habits that will improve that? Mm, awesome. Well, this was a remarkable conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time. Do you happen to have a copy of your book with you or? Uh, sure. You can hold it up. So the title is Neural Hacking for Online Learning, Study and Life Habits Optimized for Your Personal Mind, Body, Energy State with Dr. Robert Keith Wallace. Um, and Dr. Wallace, where can our viewers and listeners find you uh, online, your websites? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, this book is on Amazon uh, under Dr. Robert Keith Wallace. You'll see a lot of other books there, too, on Amazon. Um, I have several websites, but the one I really, I've, multi, I've put all the websites into one lately. So it's one uh, website, which is calling called biohackinglongevity.com. And there you'll find, uh, you know, other websites that are like something called Dosha Guru, which is all about Ayurveda, something Dharma Parenting, which is all about parenting, um, Doc Gut, which is all about dieting and, and, and health. So there are multiple websites all included in that one uh, biohacking longevity website. Okay, so it's biohackinglongevity.com. Right. Great, awesome. So yeah, so thank you so much. Thanks again for your time. My pleasure. Thank you, Noreen.